Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, when I got a, call for, a phone call from Jason asked me about uh, talking about how we built uh, the Lending Club platform, I started thinking what would be a good presentation to share with you. So the first step is I would like to establish an understanding of what financial technology is. So you ask different people, they have different answers. To some people, financial technology is a way to save costs. To others, it's a way to make operations more automated and cheaper so they can scale. Other people think it's a way to create new products that did not exist before. So all these answers are correct. But the problem with these answers is that they are not complete. So technology really is this abstract notion that has a lot of attributes, just like pretty much anything here is technology. A wheel is technology. But if you put emphasis on one attribute more than the other, you can end up answering in this way. So if I ask my CFO what is technology, she's going to tell me it's cost saving because she has to balance the revenue and the model and everything has to make sense. So because of that, there is a definition that I like that puts everything together and make it as an inclusive make it as an inclusive group of people working together. So, so if you take the Lending Club platform, for example, one of the most important things that we did is actually the legal framework. Lending Club was the first company to make sure that the securitization and going through a different bank uh, all together works. But if you go and you do a borrower registration, you're going to feel these steps one after the other one. Our online marketing strategy is also built in in the platform. Pretty much everything about P2P that we know is part of this technology platform that we build. So in that sense, I like to call it a deliverable. So it's a way for everybody in our company to express their solutions to solving the P2P platform question. There is definitely one definition that I don't like, which is the definition of a tool, uh, which is here is the business model. Go ahead, find us a tool, a technical tool to make it work. That Definition does not make sense. But there is a reason why we have that definition. It's because of the history of how technology and software has been built before. So if you take 15 years ago, 12 years ago, 20 years ago, technology was actually built in large companies. So you have companies like Oracle, IBM, and Microsoft, where the cycle to produce technology is 18 months and 24 months. So six first month is just to look at the market and see how we can create something that we can sell to as many people as possible. So in that sense, I agree, it's a tool. And always focuses on how we can make you save money, how we can make you do things that you know how to do very well, but do it better. Now, with the internet, everything changed. Earlier on, an entrepreneur, when he builds technology, the idea is to build it well enough so a large company can take it and distribute it for him. But with the internet, all businesses have changed. The business of building technology changed as well. So the most important thing is to have an agile company. And agile is a gift that somehow disappears when you go forward in the future. Nobody knows where it went. But I will explain to you my opinion why companies uh, lose agility. But the idea here is that two people straight from school, they can build software technology. And the first day they're going to have 10, 10, 10 customers. The technology they built is for 10 customers. A week later, it could be 100. So, so it grows with them as their customer base grows. So that elasticity, that agility is very important. And it's only given to us by the internet. I don't have to wait for a big distribution channel to do this. And because of that, in the last 10 years, we saw a lot of new business ideas. It's because we can try again and fail and try and try and try until we get it right. That's why businesses are succeeding today. The ability to make a mistake multiple times until you get it right. You can always repurpose what you have. So, so actually, believe it or not, today, building technology is very simple. <laughs> it's so simple that it's difficult. And I'll explain to you why it's that way. So, the building blocks, the basic building blocks of any software are already available. If you want the fastest search method, I know where it is. If you want database uh, sorting, I know where it is. The challenge for people is to make sure 
that they are making the correct choices when they are building technology. So what are these choices? For example, the technology stack is a major choice that we make. So if we decide to go with Oracle technology stack versus Microsoft technology stack, a lot of things are decided ahead of us in the future. Things like what other technologies I can use on top of Microsoft or on top of Oracle. Even the engineers that I can hire. If I happen to be in the Bay Area, I have access to a lot of engineers that understand Oracle. If I happen to be in New York, maybe it's Microsoft. Or if I happen to be in Washington State, it's probably Microsoft. So all these choices you have to factor in when you're starting at the beginning. So at the beginning, you have all the possible choices and you feel like a king. The moment you make a choice, you actually reduce the choices that you're gonna make in the future. So no, it does not look like building Lego blocks. It's actually almost like playing a chess game. And because of that, it makes the choice the most difficult decision that you take. I'm gonna try to illustrate this in an example a real example that happened to us when we were building Lending Club platform. So, so let's, let's all build a P2P platform. So what do we know? We have a bunch of lenders and borrowers. There's something called a loan, that is a loan application. We have to underwrite the loans, we have to do returns, we have to do accounts. Uh, there is data, yes, there is public data and there is personal data, we have to be careful about it. And there is regulations. So that's what we know, that's what we started with. This is a design, I have Lenders on one side, and I have borrowers on one side. Now, different people look at it differently. If I hire an engineer from Facebook, oh, this is a financial social network. No, it's not. It's a P2P platform. If I hire somebody from a bank, oh, okay, well, this is a processing machine. So different people think of it differently. But we have to define what is the innovation. So, why do we think that our design is good? So we look at banks, and we know that the model for banks is a one-to-many. You have one person or a group of people that decide who gets the money, who gets the loan. So our innovation is to give that power and the tools that are needed to execute that power to lenders on one side. So they can invest in borrowers in different geographic locations so the borrowers are not correlated and all of that. So we are building a many-to-many -many system while the existing banking system is one-to-many. And by itself, this is good. This is good enough to qualify for innovation. So it's gonna look like this, for example. People that understand technology are gonna understand this slide much better than others. So yes, that is our original design. We have to work with credit bureaus. Let's build a module for it. But we also have to work with uh, banks, uh, partners, the government. So whenever we need to work with somebody, we're going to build a module for it. It feels almost right, but it's not right. Because today, if I tell you, let's add business loans or student loans, well, you have to break down what you have in the left-hand side and redesign again. And that's a problem. So the choice that we made at the beginning of looking at the architecture as one side is lenders and one side is borrowers, is coming back to haunt us. A better model, if you really believe and understand very well what P2P is, is actually the concept of a marketplace. So what we have is lenders that are coming together for the same goal, which is how can I invest my money very well? They care about loan securitization, they care about secondary markets. We have to offer them liquidity, and yes, it has to be compliance. So this is good. This is very good. But the concept of borrower and concept of loan is missing. So how do we add it in there? Well, simple. You put a loan into the stock market by going through an IPO process, which is the equivalent of underwriting a loan. So it depends how you look at the flow you can benefit one way or another. So two models, the broker model and the stock market model. Now, let's compare them. Any system that you build has to have core competencies. Has, what is that you know better than anybody else? So in the broker model, I can process a lot of things. In the marketplace model, I am very good at keeping accounts 
I know what everybody has. I know what your transactions are. I can itemize everything. Categories. Why category is important is because when we try to partner with people, we need to know where to go. So one is banking, one is similar to the New York Stock Exchange, E-Trade, Ameritrade. Requirements. Requirements are always driven by uh, people that uh, define the product, but those people are also driven by a certain uh, understanding of how the market is. So in one case, like I mentioned before, transaction scale. Uh, new products to put in the stock market, or I call it stock market, I should be calling it uh, the loan market. And the other one is cost saving, operation automation. It's very different ways of thinking about how to solve this problem. And of course, when you need to hire the team to build it for you, the difference is huge. So if I hire a person and I tell him, we're gonna build a stock market, the first thing he's gonna think about is, oh my God, there are gonna be billions and billions of transactions. I better put scalability in every single piece of the code I do. If I hire somebody that he thinks he's building a banking infrastructure, yes, scale is important, but not as nearly as big as the case of a stock market. So this frame of reference gives people uh, the ability to communicate your ideas much better than if you pick the wrong model. So we spoke about the team. Uh, in technology, we say that uh, technology resembles the organizations that build them. So depending how the team is, you can see that in the technology that is built. For example, if you have a balanced team that has product people, that have people that are good in um, user experience, that have people that are strong in data processing, you're gonna have a balanced platform. But if you have an unbalanced team, or if you have a team that takes requirements from a group of people and says goodbye, I'll see you in two weeks to come back and build it, you're gonna have a system full of contradictions. One thing that we pay attention to is, do we need to hire developers or do we need to hire engineers? There's a big difference between the two. An engineer is somebody who either knows information or knows where information is. He spends half of his time looking for information, comparing with everything else, and then he builds it. We call them modern developers. A developer is somebody, all he wants to do is to create new things. Sometimes we need to create new things, sometimes we do not create new things. It's much better to get things that are already existing. Communication. When the team starts to grow little by little, you're gonna have difficulties communicating because that original frame of reference that was designed at the beginning and the history behind every single choice and decision that we made is actually lost. So we need to define a vocabulary that we use to communicate between the team and the products people. So uh, Lending Club, for example, we have this concept of actor. We call it actor. We don't call it lender, we don't call it borrower, we don't call it investor, we call it actor. So if I'm saying, oh, we need to make sure that we support this type of things for actors, it means that we are supporting it for all type of actors. But if I say it only applies to lenders, it only applies to lenders. So that vocabulary helps us a lot in taking our ideas as we see them and put them immediately in the, in the system. And to finish my presentation, a lot of people ask me a couple of questions. One of them is how to evaluate technology. I mean, VCs, they ask me, so is this a good technology? Is this a bad technology? My answer to that really is look at how they got to this technology. Look at the choices they made to get to this technology because that is the only way that you can use to judge how far they can go. So if the people that made the choices can explain why are we using this tech stack, why are we using this type of engineer, and why are you using this, that's yet. That's the technology that I'm going to bet on. And technologies are impressive. They can change between uh, day to day, very quickly, if the right combination happens. But what I think is next in our industry, I think you're gonna have companies like Lending Club, Prosper, that are established. They will continue to be bigger, faster, and cheaper. There will be new products with more partners coming in, with the market understanding more and more how P2P works. The integration is gonna lower even the cost. So that goal, that ideal goal of being directly connected to the lender on one side and directly connected to the borrower on one side is gonna happen. 
and it's happening faster than we think, and then you're gonna see new technologies that connect them even more and more. But I also believe, and this is my opinion, that we're gonna have more innovation in this space. For example, the notion of marketplace in education is unbelievable. So, uh, I'm in China. There are a lot of people in China that want to learn English. One way to do it is to go to the classroom and learn from somebody that teaches them English. The other way is to connect with somebody that their native language is English and happens to be, for example, in the US or England, and the use of networks, they can teach them English. How do you find somebody like that? Well, you go on a marketplace. There is actually a company that hires students here in the US after their class hours. They teach English to people in China. And there are other ways around. Uh, you need to teach your kids math and things like that. There will be people all around the world helping you with that. So globalization and marketplace is a beautiful match that's going to allow people to get services from anywhere else in the world close to you. Renault this morning was talking about happiness. Maybe what people want is happiness. Technology can give them happiness. Possibly, yes. I want to learn philosophy. I don't have to come to New York during winter time. I can be in a beach somewhere, and I can have somebody teaching me philosophy. That's one thing. The ability that these things will offer us, and the shared economy, and the ability to use the resources in an easy way and be mobile, be anywhere, it's really fantastic. And that's the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you. Any, any questions for our speaker today? Yes. Right, the question was, uh, uh, what are the differences between doing it in the US versus doing it in China? Yes, culture is important. Uh, a lot of things are important, but there is no one single answer. Uh, Lending club model as it is will not work in China. You have to deconstruct that model, see what applies and what doesn't, and you have to leverage what exists. Uh, for example, one obvious thing that exists is that the lending club uh, uh, system relies a lot on credit bureaus. Credit bureaus in China, even though they exist, they don't contain all the information. So which product do you build? You cannot create a product when people come online and apply, and in five minutes, they will get their loan. That's, that's one of the key points in the Lending Club platform. That does not exist in China. So, but there are other ways. There are other ways of doing underwriting. In that sense, what makes sense? So you have to evaluate the revenue model, you have to evaluate the operations, you have to evaluate what you have access to, and then build it as it is. Now, if you're talking about a country like Australia, the main difference that I see is scale. So in China, you have a large volume. In the US, it's big enough. But in Australia, I'm sorry, probably 25, 30 million. Is that the number? You're being generous, but yeah, we'll go with 30. OK. <laughs> 23, 23 million. So, so when you build something for 23 million people, you build it differently than if you are building it for 350 million people. So those are, those are considerations to think of. Marketplace, uh, the notion of it is that it's a volume business. Unless you have large volume, the prices are going to stay high. The more people you have contributing, the lower the prices are. It's not only technology that lowers the price, it's actually the contribution, the fact that you have a lot of people using it that makes it cheaper. Are you sure you want to ask me that question? <laughs> so money is already flowing across borders, but not in the context of P2P. Uh, in the room, we have uh, uh, an expert in that, probably you can talk to him. Mark uh, Fendergris uh, does a lot of uh, things related to that. But uh, uh, technically, it's simple. Regulation-wise, it's a nightmare. So that's, that's, that's the problem. We have technology to do all of these things. We have technology that deals with the fact that I have one account, uh, half of it is US dollar, half of it is RMB. We can deploy it anytime we want. But can you use it? In fact, we even have customers in China that tell us, you know, we really like this concept of diversification. I have a US-based dollar account. Can you put some of it on Lending Cloud Platform and some of it here? And the only thing that prevents them is the language barrier. So if we translate the Lending Cloud Platform, these people will turn it into customers within a week. So language, 
regulations are definitely one of the barriers to having this globalization. But globalization is just something that happened, what, 15 years ago, 10 years ago? And look where we are today. It's actually going super fast. Good? All right, let's thank our speaker.